Sun Tzu teaches us that the great general first seeks victory, then seeks battle. You're ready to command this small army. Consider it your first test. Total War has been out for more than two decades. Features have come and gone, different settings have been visited, but if there's one thing that has remained a relative constant in that period, morale. Just to avoid confusion, I'll make it clear that I'll use the word morale to describe what is called leadership in the Warhammer Total War titles. Morale is a game mechanic made Total War distinct from other real-time tactics games. Whereas units in a game of Age of Empires, whether poorly armed villagers or expertly trained knights, will simply deal a set amount of damage to a given target, and will fight just as effectively at its last hit point as it will at full health, Total War instead attempted to simulate a completely separate, but related aspect to combat. The willingness of a soldier or a regiment to keep on fighting. Under this system, there are two general characteristics of a unit that are simulated. The unit's killing power, expressed in qualities such as melee attack and defense, and its willingness to keep on fighting, expressed in morale. While killing power is relatively straightforward as a concept, Morale as implemented in Total War originally was a far more dynamic aspect of gameplay, and the way it interacts with killing power and understanding these interactions is key to mastering a Total War game. At least before 2013, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, he got destroyed. He got destroyed. I think he got destroyed. Wow. Oh my god, what a moron. What okay. a moron. So there's yeah. the reason why we this tank is just demolishing us, is because our tank just goes and ends up getting killed in the first like 15 seconds of gameplay. I will take a moment to discuss the real world inspiration for the morale mechanic, and I will make it clear for those who may be new to the channel that I am not a quote historical Total War fan. While my favorite Total War game, Shogun 2, has a historically inspired setting, ultimately I'm a gameplay first kind of person, though I do find it interesting to see where certain elements of a game's design draw their inspiration from. In the case of morale, you don't have to go searching far to find that inspiration. The very first Total War game was openly drawing its design principles from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. A central tenet of his teachings, and a highly resonant one, is this. For to win a hundred battles is not the acme of skill. To subdue the enemy without fighting is the acme of skill. What are the implications of this statement and how does this concept manifest in our own history? Battles and wars are not won through annihilating the enemy, rather by destroying their will to fight. Video games and to a lesser extent movies have warped our perception of combat. How many times were you tasked with killing all enemy soldiers in an area before being allowed to proceed? These instances of fighting to the death, the complete destruction of the enemy force, are exceedingly rare in our own history. In fact, the casualty rates in your average battle were often in the single digit percentage range, or somewhere in the 10-15% to range for the losing side. The rate would be much higher if you factored in casualties from disease or captured soldiers, but that's not something games tend to depict. It's a very kill or be killed affair. Case in point, the Battle of Austerlitz, known as one of the most impressive victories scored in military history. Of the roughly 70,000 French soldiers, about 8,000 were killed or wounded, while on the defeated coalition side, 16,000 were killed and wounded, with another 20,000 being captured. Out of at most 95,000 soldiers who fought on the coalition side. Even in one of the most stunning military victories and a lopsided engagement, the majority of the defeated forces escaped to fight another day. For those listening, this may have evoked images of those early Total War campaign battles. The ones where you were lacking in cavalry, where you soundly routed the enemy force but were forced to watch as many of them escaped with their lives. And if you were fighting on enemy territory, where they can more easily replenish and reinforce while your supply lines are overstretched, the feeling was made worse knowing how, despite winning on the field, 
your army is nonetheless left in a precarious position. And this too was a feeling quite familiar to military leaders and even the common soldier. They were, if competent, aware that the war would go on till either side lost the will to fight. And the incompetent? Or the overconfident? They embarked on campaigns of destruction, their attempts to subdue the enemy through fear only strengthening the enemy's resolve. War, after all, is a question of resolve and not simply sheer firepower. If you're interested in Japanese history, particularly the Sengoku period, then you may already be thinking of the Japanese invasion of Korea in the 1590s. At first glance, and as many of the Japanese commanders believed, the Korean defenders scarcely stood a chance, at least as far as the war on land was concerned. And as things began to unfold after the first Japanese soldiers disembarked, it really did seem they would quickly assert control over the peninsula. The Korean land forces were no match in a conventional field battle, where they were pitted against soldiers who were far more experienced. But the level of destruction caused by the Japanese as they took over cities served only to encourage the Koreans to disrupt Japanese operations in whatever way they could, by both harrying them on land through guerrilla tactics and especially on sea, where the Japanese didn't see any need to guard their transport fleets. What may have been a quick victory quickly turned into a battle of attrition the Japanese were not prepared for. As I said earlier, in real life you don't win by eliminating all hostiles in the area. In fact, if your goal is conquest, this might be the last thing you'd want. But by destroying their will to fight, by convincing them that surrender is preferable to fighting to the death. And it's impressive to see how well Total War captured that dynamic in its very first outing back in 2000. Even today, getting to terms with the clunky controls, Shogun 1 is a very satisfying game to play, with fluid chain routes defining the gameplay. The jostling for positions prior to the fight, the consideration of the placement of every unit in your battle formation, the first volleys, the charge and the joining of lines, and the wide maneuvers to deliver the crushing blow. Sun Tzu's quotes featured in the game are more than just fancy theming. Your bid for Shogun of all Japan. Why the hell do we even have a German-made tank on our side? Uh -oh. uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, boss. <laughs> You're on me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you? Yeah. yeah can you, you know. You, you know it. Yeah. Uh, you. You take. You. You take the. Hey. Are. Are you sure? Da, it's, da, it's, da, le da. It's, le it's left-hand steering. Are you okay with that? It's literally in the middle of the I'm desert. Good. <laughs> it's literally in the middle of the desert. <laughs> It is interesting to assess all aspects of gameplay that emerge from just this one mechanic, morale. Morale is what makes the battle line so important. The battle line offers the main axis of battle, through which one can send units in flanking and rear attacks. It's what can make a balanced army greater than the sum of its parts. Before you may realize it, you're going on ambitious offensive military ventures with fewer and fewer units, Instead of slowly building up a largely samurai force as you were when you were learning the ropes, you're now engaging in Blitzkrieg on the campaign map with modestly sized armies composed of basic spear infantry and archers, supported by only a few stronger units. You're perfectly fine getting your army sandwiched between two enemy forces, ready to exploit the opportunity for defeat in detail. Then, when you're in battle, you set up your spear infantry line, ready to absorb the enemy's charge before feeding your heavy infantry to join the ensuing melee, all while your cavalry remain aloof, probing for any sign of weakness in the enemy's order of battle. With the first army in a rout, you can now turn your attention to the second force forming up. You rush your men to a forested mountainside, forming a defensive line on either side of the waterfall. A rock face overlooking a depression provides the ideal spot for your archers to keep firing after the melee commences. Whittling down the enemy while your cavalry, having been concealed amid the trees on a nearby hill, rush in to deliver another killing blow. You may have done all this, making all these considerations, pulling off victories in the face of superior forces, all without needing any tutorials, and all without the game doling out instructions to you.
Because units will suffer morale shocks when hit from the flank or rear, it naturally follows that you will want to engineer as many scenarios as possible where enemy units have their flanks and rears exposed. This is game design recreating real world dynamics, not just for the sake of historical accuracy, but more importantly, for the sake of creating interesting gameplay that encourages experimentation and rewards resourcefulness. It's also interesting to see other strategies and tactics that are made possible or made more effective by the morale mechanic, which if you do some reading, you'll find out these were tactics that real life commanders were well aware of and made full use of. No, oh, we have our own vehicle this time. It's already, it's already. <laughs> yeah, <I'm enjoying> it. <laughs> 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 well. <laughs> there exists an idea in military theory called friction. It starts with the assumption that a military force will be at its strongest at the outset of a campaign. Soldiers are in well organized formations, commanders are aware of their objectives, logistics are well managed, equipment is in good condition, and so on. This level of organization will immediately begin to break down upon taking the very first step. Soldiers become tired, some begin to fall behind, formations and baggage trains begin stretching out, vehicles and or wagons start breaking down, unexpected roadblocks may be encountered, and it only gets worse once the enemy is encountered. No plan survives contact with the enemy, as Helmuth von Moltke once said. As battle is joined, casualties begin to mount, Soldiers fall out of formation amid the noise and confusion, weapons begin breaking, ammunition may be expended faster than it's resupplied, commanders, beset by the confusion of battle and oftentimes unclear or conflicting orders, and orders that before the advent of communication technologies were often out of date, find it more and more difficult to both keep their formations in order as well as coordinate with one another. In comes the idea of defense in depth. Defense in Depth seeks to exploit this very friction in an opposing force by giving ground to the enemy and allowing them to overcome successive lines of defense, the advancing forces will soon find themselves dispersed, not only leaving them vulnerable to counter charges, but on the larger scale, this can lead to a number of bulges appearing in the line, or salients. If you look at any maps of the war in the Eastern Front during World War II, you can see these salients forming and it's no surprise that these were prime targets for an attack. The Battle of Stalingrad, arguably the most decisive of the whole war, was itself a devastating display of defense in depth. The Soviets gave up large swaths of ground in the city to the advancing Axis forces, who proceeded to dangerously overextend themselves as they left their northern and southern flanks undermanned, so the entire German 6th Army was annihilated in a massive pincer movement. Going back more than a century, you can see the Russian Empire taking advantage of defense in depth on the largest of scales. Napoleon's force had made it as far as Moscow indeed, at the cost of leaving themselves with exposed flanks stretching hundreds of kilometers on either side of their advance, culminating in Napoleon's disastrous retreat westwards. By encouraging the enemy to overextend, one can create the opportunity for local engagements, where the force multipliers are in favor of the counter-attackers. They have the ability to concentrate their forces at a given point on the line before the attacker has the chance to shore up that position. This happens quite often in Fall of the Samurai, especially in siege defenses taking place in multi-tiered forts. By the time the besieging force has made its way to the Tenshu, they will have climbed multiple walls and fought their way through several courtyards, all while under withering gunfire, only to leave themselves especially vulnerable to getting swarmed on their flanks. In field battles where you have a lot of line infantry, but don't have enough room to stretch them out and bring their weapons to bear, and where you happen to be fighting elite samurai units, setting the men up in lines can be very effective. By placing less experienced line infantry or levy units in front, they can absorb the charge while allowing the better units in the second line to continue firing through gaps. By the time the first line breaks, that is, if it breaks, the enemy units will have been bloodied and may not even get another charge off, instead slowly walking into a melee with your well-rested rear troops. And because the units in the first line are unlikely to rout all at the same moment, this means you'll often have individual enemy units filing through to fight your second line creating a sort of salient that I mentioned earlier. 
If you have any cavalry or melee units left in reserve, this is the kind of target they'll be looking for. All right, well, uh, you know, if you if you get your butt out of my face while I'm trying to... I, I wasn't even in front of you, man. Snipe. What the hell? That was weird. Okay, I see. I see your... Ow. Ow. I'm healing you. Don't worry. All the positions. I'm spotting them. I'm spotting Dead. them. I'm spotting them. Man, it's really different. It's a really different perspective being looking down the battle from here. A bit of a tangent here. Defense and depth tactics are most commonly associated with World War I trench warfare. Incidentally, I remember way back in 2012, coinciding with Fall of the Samurai's release, that there was a sentiment going around on YouTube and forums at the time that it wouldn't make sense for Total War, which had until then be focused on pre-modern formation warfare, to go to a World War I setting. And this is a sentiment that you can still find on forums to this very day. Now that time has given me a much stronger grasp of concepts in military strategy, I find this sentiment close-minded and ridiculous. Partly because there is a World War I total war out there, it's Fall of the Samurai. Long-range artillery fire, devising ways to concentrate firepower in a given area, defense and depth tactics, softening up an entrenched enemy's position before an assault. These were all prominent elements of warfare during the First World War, and they are featured pretty heavily in Fall of the Samurai. It's crudely implemented, sure, but it's there. Bolt-action rifles were standard issue in World War I, and were in fact already featured in Fall of the Samurai, being used by the French Marines unit and by Guard Infantry. And it really wouldn't take much more work to add machine guns and howitzers to the game. I mean, the latter already existed in Empire and Napoleon. Machine guns exist in Fall of the Samurai in the form of Gatling guns. There were so many ways you could have taken Total War after 2012, but the path that was taken was anything but a positive one. As you can see, there is something deeply wrong with Rome 2's battle design, and it's tragically the DNA that will be used in the rest of the games going forward. Morale as a concept is not central to the gameplay. In fact, it's hardly even relevant, as unit quality has become the major decider of the outcome of a fight. You might think the AI is stupid for bunching up its units like this, and yes, this is the highest difficulty, as smart as it gets, but there is no penalty to doing this. The effect of flanking and rear charges even by cavalry galloping at full speed, are negligible. Rome 2 also basically snuck in a major change to the fundamental design of units, health bars. I'll go into this in more detail shortly, but first I need to dispel an ongoing misconception that morale is still a decisive factor in battles, both in Rome 2 and subsequent titles. Additionally, forests can hide certain units, allowing you to execute ambushes and devastating flanking maneuvers to bamboozle your foes. and devastating flanking maneuvers to bamboozle your foes. An unexpected charge into the enemy flanks won't just kill their troops, but more importantly, it helps shatter their morale. Withdraw! 
It's not often a battle will grind itself down to the last man standing. It's not often a battle will grind itself down to the last man standing. Instead, most wars are won in the hearts and minds of the people. It's much easier to route most units than it is to outright kill them. Next, make it a priority to abuse flanking and surround your enemies, but also prevent them from doing exactly the same thing to you. You can do this by grouping armies into tight formations. Hitting your enemy's weak sides will always prove to be advantageous. Charging at them will grant a temporarily leadership bonus, which will temporarily boost the unit's morale. And on the topic of leadership, this is the most important attribute in combat, even more so than a unit's actual health pool. To the Helden Taking that position! Yes, sir. Quickly. Start quickly. Taking position at speed. Ready to serve. Formation march. But I cry. Never conquer. Jade Lancers. Warriors, defend the realm! Never conquered! Overwhelmed! Withdraw! Here are the things to keep in mind. Negating an enemy cavalry charge bonus using units that have charged defense such as Grand Cathay's Jade Warriors or Peasant Long Spearmen, charging at an enemy line, protecting a unit's flank, or encouragement from nearby lords and heroes will all increase your leadership. Being surrounded or having to deal with enemies on at least two different sides, having low vigor when the unit is exhausted, if a unit takes too many losses in a small amount of time, taking too much damage in a small amount of time, or if your lords or heroes fall in combat, will decrease your leadership. All over the Total War internet sphere, be it on forums or in YouTube videos, there's a lingering belief that morale and all the tactics it would encourage, hammer and anvil, defeat in detail, defense in depth, so on, are still present and important aspects of gameplay. These clips should clearly demonstrate otherwise. In Rome 2, the only way I can turn this fight from defeat to victory is by changing my army composition, whereas in Shogun 2, the game directly preceding it, all I need to do is pin down these katana samurai for my cavalry to deliver the killing blow, routing a superior force through basic thinking and resourcefulness, taking advantage of the synergy offered by spear and horse. My lord, a glorious victory will soon be yours. So why do people still act as though such morale-based tactics are still viable? It's easy to dismiss it as them not having enough knowledge of the older games or just not being good. After all, plenty of people suck at good games too. I like to take the most charitable explanation, being that they simply have misinterpreted what they observe in battles. What they see is their superior units trouncing enemy armies through an envelopment, when in reality the enveloping maneuver itself has little effect on the outcome of the battle. It's the superior unit quality that is winning the day, and that can easily mislead you into thinking your tactics are delivering morale shocks when they aren't. This is why testing is so important in the context of analyzing a game's design. 
Without controlling for variables such as terrain or unit quality, it becomes much more difficult to know which elements are having an effect, what kind of effect they're having, and to what degree. By fighting two battles using the same army compositions, the only difference being the terrain in question, a flat map versus a steep slope, you can very quickly conclude that in Total War Warhammer 2, terrain has such a negligible impact on the outcome of a melee that the difference is within the margin of error. This unit, okay, has routed. Let's see if we can roll up the flank now and accelerate this defeat. Okay. We took roughly the same losses that we took in the last fight. Despite, ha despite no terrain advantage over here at all, despite the massive terrain advantage we had in the last fight, the, the discrepancy, we only lost about 10... We ended up... Hang on, we ended up losing fewer men in this fight fighting on level terrain than we did in the last fight. I don't know how long this fight has lasted. We're more than 10 minutes over here despite despite the huge discrepancy in unit quality and the terrain advantage and flanking and complete surround. And by fighting two battles on Shogun 2, both on the same map and using the same armies, where we simply change how we use the given units, you can very clearly see that blobbing your units into something resembling an ant swarm is far less effective then pinning the enemy force in the center while you send units around on the wings. Then you can conduct the same test in Rome 2 and see that your units are effectively blessed with victory or doomed to defeat before the battle is even fought. It's a glorified card matching game masquerading as an intelligent battle simulator. And this reductive design reaches its pinnacle in the Warhammer games, where you thoughtlessly point and click your identical single entities to victory. Total War has always had a problem with battles having foregone conclusions, but the Warhammer games take it a step further, almost turning battles into what I can only describe as a drawn-out quick time event. But hey, Shogun 2 is literally just the Ashigaru spam, it's kind of the same thing. Okay, I've seen this argument get bandied around for years, even though it's been outdated since maybe 2012, but that won't discourage me from attempting to dismantle it once and for all. Don't worry, this won't take long. Yari Ashigaru are the backbone of Shogun 2 armies, not because they're a powerful unit, but because they're cheap and versatile. They can hold the line pretty well, but also quickly break if left unsupported. Their low cost and high numbers when combined with loose formation make them prime candidates for drawing our fire away from your more valuable units. Their anti-cavalry bonus makes them great at holding the flanks against cavalry. Yari Wall makes them very effective at blocking units and controlling the pace and direction of the fight and siege defenses. It also makes them useful in rear guard actions, where you need only delay an enemy force. And finally, they can act as cannon fodder if you have no better uses for them. Yari Ashigaru are a multi-dimensional unit. They aren't just one-dimensional meat shields as is the case with the cheaper infantry units in Rome 2 or the Warhammer titles, whom you will seek to replace as soon as you have better options available. And this versatility is very, very important in holding up the rest of the game's design. By being decent but not the best in most roles, they allow the rest of your army to be specialized. Whether it's pinning down the enemy for your cavalry to deal a killing blow, or presenting targets for your matchlocks, or clearing out cavalry units that might threaten your nodachi. Yari Ashigaru can do a lot of things and bring a lot to your army, but what they aren't going to do is just defeat an army of katana samurai because you pointed and then clicked at them. And, I should not leave this unsaid, but defending the single entity doom stacks of Warhammer by shifting attention to another game is just an exercise in whataboutism. Just because a problem exists in one game doesn't excuse it in another. Alright. There's an awesome area to snipe from over here. I, I At the bottom of the, of, of, the, of the airship, there's like a hole that you can just snipe through. And like nobody, nobody notices that you're there. Oh sh! Oh, the oh what? No, they can actually shoot through the tarp on the on the on the health bars. Other channels have already showcased the unit quality centric design of Rome 2 and the uselessness of conventional tactics. But another significant change: the transition from hit points to health bars rarely gets scrutinized. In fact, you may not have been aware of this change as was the case with myself despite having over 100 hours in Rome 2. What was the system used in older titles? Most models in the unit had one hit point, with more elite units having two or three per model. When attacked, a model would either dodge or parry the blow, or take the hit and die. Damage under the system was mostly lethal. There was such a thing as glancing blows, which dealt only half a hit point of damage, 
but overall combat was a binary affair. Armor and melee defense values simply reduced the chances of being hit. What these values did not do was confer extra hit points. If you want a better idea of why combat in the more recent titles is so slow and indecisive, you need to understand that these units aren't comprised of individuals who can survive or die. These are units that have a health bar attached to them that is slowly depleting. It's kind of like if you took your average unit in Age of Empires and just split them into 10 models while they're functionally the same. It works with and compounds with the irrelevance of morale to reduce the ability of a player to deal more damage to the enemy while reducing the risk posed to their own soldiers, a fundamental goal of military tactics. Why was this curious shift to health bars made? The theory. Like the rest of Total War's design, the games have been more and more trying to ape design elements from more traditional RTS titles, such as Age of Empires. But there's a reason health bars can work well in one game and utterly damage the other. Age of Empires is a fundamentally different game with a different design philosophy. It's not a combat simulator, but a resource gathering game. It was designed from the ground up to feature health bars. The context is crucial. Age of Empires is all about pumping military forces out faster than your opponent can, all while ensuring you can more effectively replace your losses. Total War was not such a game. The focus was on military tactics, on morale, on finding ways to defeat the enemy force as quickly as possible, instead of wastefully expending your forces in bad engagements. Raising and replacing your forces was something that you managed on the campaign layer. Within the context of battle, you are focusing on formations, deployment, the usage of terrain, and so on. You cannot simply amputate a design element that worked in a very different game and stitch it to this one and expect it to work seamlessly. All it really does is reinforce the meta of spamming the best unit you can. Health bars, difficulty buffs to the AI, the irrelevance of morale, it all comes together to ensure you will be very quickly working out the most optimal composition and recreating it over and over again. That normally means ranged heavy builds, and in the case of Warhammer, fielding doom stacks of single entities that are so incredibly dominant there are entire videos dedicated to ranking them in tier lists. And I'm going to reiterate a point I've already made in other videos. Warhammer being a fantasy game does not excuse its design flaws. A game where you're incentivized, actually effectively forced, into fielding copy-paste stacks is fundamentally uninteresting, and this might explain why there's a constant demand for new factions to be added to the game as DLC. Because the game is designed in such a manner that it stifles creativity and leaves no incentive for the player to play a given faction more than once. And it's not even accurate to the Warhammer lore, because that argument gets thrown around frequently whenever the discussion veers towards these titles. Why do they have tanks? <laughs> I like the idea of some uh, Italian dude like going into the war and is like <laughs> and they're constantly getting overrun by German tanks and he's like <laughs> and this in this really thick Italian accent why do they have a tank hey baba boy why do they have a tank hey hey luigi my boy <laughs> before we take a trip to the warhammer fantasy universe let's talk about guns in total war just to avoid confusion, I'm referring to small arms, not gunpowder or artillery. Guns have played an important role in Total War games, oftentimes disproportionate to the amount of guns you leave in field. Outside of the gunpowder era games, Empire, Napoleon, and Fall of the Samurai, firearm units came into the picture quite late in the campaign. Nevertheless, their effects on the balance were outsized. Unlike more well-known RTS titles, the projectiles aren't just arrows that move faster and on a flat trajectory with different stat modifiers. The flat trajectory brings quite a lot of emphasis to even the most minute imperfections in the terrain, while the projectiles are much better at piercing armor, and in Shogun 2's case, ignoring armor altogether. That point about armor piercing matters quite a lot for maintaining unit balance. Higher armor typically means a more elite unit with better melee prowess and high morale. On the extreme end, these units are effectively unbreakable. They can be seen lingering on the battlefield long after the rest of their army has been routed. Firearms provided a direct hard counter to these units. A good volley or two meant you could save yourself the trouble of expending multiple melee units, or the trouble of having a unit or more get tied down while they are needed elsewhere. With even the cheapest gunpowder units being effective at countering higher quality units, 
They acted as a final stopgap measure against the unit quality arms race. The type of arms race that has gone on to infect Total War starting in Rome 2, as very few of any units can act decisively. Warhammer gave us single entities that are decisive, but unlike gunpowder units in Shogun 2 or earlier, who can be thwarted through careful usage of terrain, sacrificing expendable units, and engaging them in a melee, single entities in Warhammer and subsequent games don't have a direct counter, neither in unit types nor in tactics. The only reliable path to defeating this win button is by bringing your own win button, an arms race that reminds me of poorly thought out RPGs where the spoils go to the person who grinded the hardest. So, the first important value is 1600. This is the power floor. The next extremely important value is 1750. This is the soft cap. So, from 1600 all the way to 1750, every single piece of gear you get will advance your overall power level. So, the random blue you got from an enemy, another random blue that you got for doing a public event, a legendary you got from doing a quest line, all of that stuff will be higher in power level than your overall power level and will serve to... And look, you may point out Rome Total War is considered a good game despite not having gunpowder infantry by virtue of its setting. This is kind of missing the point. It's not about guns per se, but balancing units in a way that there is a hard counter to every type. Awesome sauce. Yep, the, the units are wavering when they're already at like almost zero health at this point. Like I don't even know what the point of routing is if you have to grind the unit into the dust. Oh, this attack plane. Oh my lord. Rumpler. And they're, it's British as well. Oh my god. You got British yeah. using German tanks, Turks using. Uh, I guess. I guess this is like the military version of like fancy dress week, fancy dress went Friday or something, where they all use different <laughs> equipment. So, what does the Warhammer lore say about military tactics in that universe? The Battle of Blackfire Pass was a major engagement between an alliance of men and dwarves on one side and Greenskins on the other hand. King Sigmar countered the overwhelming numbers of the Greenskins by having his men take up positions in the narrowest part of the pass. This works because in a choke point only the front ranks on the other side can be engaged, which ends up favoring the smaller force typically. At one point in the battle, the Alliance's left flank came under severe strain and eventually broke. This very well could have led to their defeat had it not been for Sigmar rushing in with his bodyguard to reinforce that position. The allied victory at this battle would lead to the establishing of the empire. Morale and basic military tactics were featured prominently in a battle that would go on to define the shape of the Warhammer universe. It's dishonest and misleading to defend the terrible design of the Warhammer games by appealing to the lore when the lore itself features armies adopting battle lines, hammer and anvil tactics and keeping units in reserve. And it's insulting to fantasy as a genre to insinuate that anything goes because it's fantasy that the genre can be held to a lower standard. That's the same mentality that brought us the last several terrible seasons of Game of Thrones and the nonsense ridden rings of power show. <laughs> oh man, oh, oh, whoa, wow, wow, whoa, man, this, 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 whoa, keep this, moving, this, keep this, moving. Truck, this truck was rolling down the hill. I'm like, holy oh my god oh, 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 oh what is happening over here what is happening what is happening <laughs> the, oh, oh. health bars have also caused another game design casualty it's much harder to gauge the fighting power of a given unit whether your own or the enemies by just looking at it my fellow shogun 2 connoisseurs you know how that game prevents you from seeing enemy unit stats on legendary difficulty Hovering over an enemy unit will only show you its name, the number of men in the unit, and its current morale state. At first, this might seem like a case of overly restricting the player's abilities for the sake of manufacturing challenge, but in actuality, only a small amount of vital information is being hidden from the player here. That's because you don't need to see the exact stats of a unit of Yari Samurai to gauge its fighting power. You simply looked at how many men were in the unit, or all the dead men surrounding it. This is a subtle yet incredibly effective way of marrying gameplay to visuals. It's seamless. I don't need to trudge through a stat sheet to see that a unit has 36,000 HP left out of 52,000. 
When every soldier in the unit is a single hit point, when almost every hit has the potential to kill a soldier outright, I need only glance at a unit to know how much of a threat it poses to me. This is something that has been lost starting with Rome 2. Instead of the game respecting your intuition and allowing you to devastate any infantry unit with a clean charge to the rear, you have to check or guess how much HP the target has to judge whether the charge will even do anything. It's completely normal to watch a bunch of models get knocked down only to stand back up. You might argue that the old hit point system and this health bar system are just two different ways of achieving the same effect. But that's not true. Each and every model in a unit is a model that can deal damage in return. To illustrate that point, would you rather knock 10 soldiers down to half their HP or kill 5 of them outright? This health bar system means that the same exact charge under the same circumstances can have wildly different results if we simply change the amount of health the target unit has. This is why a unit can take entire volleys of archer fire while barely suffering casualties, while another volley manages to kill 10 men. Games work best when actions have consistent results. Morale buffs and debuffs made sense and while they certainly didn't always activate predictably, on the whole, the system that we had from Shogun 1 to Shogun 2 behaved consistently. The health bar system is the antithesis of that consistency. Unless you're willing to pour in dozens or hundreds of hours studying the minute health and weapon damage differences between the units in a bloated roster. If you want to learn more about the way Total War has fumbled its design language, I'll link my video on the matter in the pop-out banner and the description. Heavily recommend you check that out. I hope we don't end up in the scenario where we're on different teams. Like that, that would be that would break my heart. That would be the worst. That but... would actually break my heart. <laughs> oh well, I, I, no, not I, not at the Polish guys on a different team. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> All of this isn't to say that the older Total War games had a flawless implementation of morale and its related tactics. There has always been a problem of power creep in campaigns, or more precisely, experience creep. If you've ever fought Yari Samurai with five or more levels of experience led by an experienced general, you know what I'm referring to. Those moments where the enemy is caught in what should be a highly disadvantaged position, surrounded and with their friends routing while they themselves are taking heavy casualties, and yet they refuse to even flinch. People not finishing their Total War campaigns has long been a meme. And however true this may be, it's easy to see why you would give up finishing one when your own units have become so powerful. And on top of that, you have well-developed provinces that can recruit highly experienced replacements right out of the gate. That you can even choose to just auto-resolve all your fights and not have to care about suboptimal results. Also, while I knocked Rome 2 and subsequent games for having an arms race meta, I should mention that this has its beginnings earlier. No, I'm not referring to Empire. I'm referring to Father the Samurai. What's the difference between line infantry, imperial infantry, marines, and guard infantry? Sure, they have different models, different descriptions, different building requirements and costs, but down on the ground, during battle, how are these units used differently? Fundamentally, they are the same unit. They all have access to kneel fire and suppression fire, and they all fire the same projectile. As you go up the stack, you get better reload, accuracy, morale, and melee prowess. The only drawback being increased cost. While Fall of the Samurai is still a great game, you can already see signs of what was to come in later titles. And that should tell you if you're thinking I'm just asking for more of Shogun 2 based on everything I've said in this video, that I'm actually not. That game came out more than 10 years ago and was good for its time. Rome 2, Warhammer 2 and 3, these games should all have been better than their predecessors where it counts. On the ground, during the heat of battle. And it's not like these games have gotten better in their campaigns either. And if you want to find out more about how the campaign experience has degraded in these games, you can check out my previous video on the army systems. I'll link that in the pop-out banner. I've got to listen to this guy speak to me the whole time in French. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> it's... Italian, dude. That's, uh, uh, Spanish? <laughs> Is he speaking Polish right now? I can't tell. Like The thing is, if it was literally any other nationality, I know he's joking. But because he's British, I have to assume that he just does not know the difference. <laughs> it's misleading to describe the newer Total War games as battle simulators or even real-time tactics games. 
I think everything showcased so far in this video makes a strong case for this. If you want an even better sense of just how abstracted the combat has become, transitioning from a simulation of real-life tactics to a quote, defeat all enemies in this area to progress type of game. You know, those games where you walk into a quiet room and suddenly both doors are shut and will only open once you defeat all the hostiles. However little sense that makes in universe, why would the enemy force just allow you to progress? Then we need to look at the relatively obscure design elements from the older Total War games. Only obscure if you haven't played the games prior to Empire Total War. From Shogun 1 to Medieval 2 in field battles, Units that got completely surrounded would enter an unbreakable state, where they would fight to the very last man. It added another dimension to the gameplay where you would deliberately leave a route of escape for enemy units, and following from this, it harkened back to another one of Sun Tzu's teachings, that an army left with no route of escape, facing a likely death and having nothing left to lose, would fight its hardest. Now I know that later games still had units enter an unbreakable state during siege defenses, or if you're being funny and you use Banzai to achieve this effect, but it would have been nice if this feature was brought back to field battles. It's a microcosm of the apparent shift in thinking in designing these games. What started out as an attempt to recreate the tactics and scenarios faced by real-life commanders and armies has turned into what every casualized game tries to do, that being giving you an extremely clear mode of gameplay where the developers have thought up every scenario you'll come across. You can't defeat superior forces through defeat in detail, or through a combined arms strategy where you bring an army to the battle that is greater than the sum of its parts. You can't throw an enemy force into disarray through thoughtful defense and depth tactics. You just find the unit that has the best stats and attempt to recreate that stack over and over again. Well, if you've reached this far, I'll have to thank you for watching this essay on where I really just wanted an excuse to talk about some military tactics. Special thanks to those of you on Discord and elsewhere for giving me a guiding hand and stuff to test. There is so little testing material on Total War YouTube, I mean I wonder why, that these projects quickly bloat in size because you have to do everything yourself from scratch. If you're new to the channel, I mostly do gameplay videos for Total War, including Let's Plays of Shogun 2 and multiplayer battle replays from Medieval 2, Napoleon, Shogun 2, and Attila. And if you have any of those replays, uh, you can hop onto Discord, the uh, link is in the description below, and share them there and I'll get to them as soon as I can. I've also ventured into making videos and streams of Battlefield 1, which supplied many of the clips in this video, and I do have an interest in showcasing Zelda Breath of the Wild, my favorite open world game. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next video, because the more I learn about Total War, the more there is to talk about.